Well, good morning. You all right? Good. It, uh, it makes my heart good as a dad uh, to see you uh, singing and leading for the first time. And it's a good job. Well done. Yeah. Yep. It's good stuff. Well, we're talking about joy this morning. Tim, give me just a little bit more, uh, me, just a little bit, please. Not that I want to hear myself, but I want to hear myself. We are starting, we started a new series last week, Won't You Be a Good Neighbor? And we talked about the one verse in Romans chapter 13, verse 8. It is one of those verses where you can memorize it if you haven't already. Owe nothing to anyone except for the debt of love. And so that's one of those easy ones that you can memorize and and know and put in your spirit and put in your heart to owe nothing to anyone except for the debt of love. And we talked about how we have this debt that we can never repay. And when we come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life, we have been freed. And so Paul is going to talk about this freedom. But this freedom comes with this obligation. And the obligation is to love like Jesus loved. And we talked about how the world has hijacked that love and how the world makes it sound like just love everybody, no matter what, love them all. And, and, and we should. But we should also tell them there's a train coming. And we got to love them enough to help them off the tracks. And so Paul's book of Galatians is really all about this centering focus of living life with Jesus. Today we're going to look at what, we're going to begin looking at what love produces and each week, we're going to talk about a couple of different things that love produces. Now, how do I, where do I come up with this idea of love producing something? Well, Paul talks about it, and you've heard it before. You've just heard it in a different way. You've, you probably know it as the fruit of the Spirit. How many have heard of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Now, A good English person would understand that it's not fruits of the Spirit. It is fruit of the Spirit. Is that plural? Is that singular? Anybody want to take a guess? The fruit of the Spirit, is that one or many? Many? Good. You learned good English. Well, it's really one. Sorry I tricked you. And most of you know that by now. That's why you don't raise your hands anymore. (laughs) You've caught on. But it is fruit of the Spirit. And if we look at that, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And the English goes on, and it says, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, flip the page, and self-control. There is no law against these things. In English, it seems like there's many fruits that have produced. But really, there's one fruit that produces many others. And without this first fruit, so to speak, the others won't happen. In Greek, there is kind of this formula that, that takes place. And, it's, and you see it in lots of the writings of Paul. And Paul uses it in lots of different places. Usually his list isn't this long. Usually it's these three things are make faith, hope, and love. And they build upon one another. Peter uses the same thing when he talks about perseverance and endurance. But Paul uses this kind of Greek formula here to describe the life of Jesus and the fruit that is produced by following the life of Jesus. Without getting complicated, it's simply love. 
And when we love like Jesus, when we live like Jesus, when we understand how Jesus loves us, then we can begin to produce these other things in our life. But joy and peace and patience does not come along without first understanding love and how Jesus loves us and what he wants from us. Self-control does not make sense in the context of love the whole world without any other thing. Because the love that the world wants to talk about is do what you want, when you want, how you want. You're the boss. You've heard it said, your truth is your truth. You go live your, you go, and this one kind of just wears on me every, every little bit. And, and I know what it means, but in some context, it just kind of wears me thin. And that takes a lot. You go do you. No. You don't get to go do you. You don't get to go be your own person. You get to go be what Jesus wants you to be, and then you can live in freedom in the context and shelter of the Most High because you've given your life to him as Lord and Savior. You don't get to just go choose what you want to do. Now, inside the life of Jesus Is there freedom to to choose and be and go and do? Absolutely. There's no shackles. There's no real set, this is what you have to do. you got to do this job and do this and live this. And What Jesus says is, listen, I've set some boundaries for you. You ever go bowling? And, and uh, go with your kids and make them put the bumper guards in there. You know what I'm talking about? The gutter guards where they put the things in the gutter so that you can't gutter the ball. And no matter where, how you throw the ball, it's going to hit some pins. I love using my kids at times. I was like, hey, you know what? We need some gutter guards because these kids just aren't really. And I'll bowl like a 260. Man, I'm just like. Wham! Bouncing it like ski. I mean, it's just fantastic. But Jesus says, listen, I'm going to put some gutter guards in for you. There's two things that you must do. And then inside of these things, you're free to kind of do what you want to do. As long as you stay inside these gutter guards. Do you know the two things? The first one is the greatest commandment. It is to love the Lord God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It is the Shema of the Old Testament. And the second, Jesus says, is, the great, is, is just as great as the first. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. And inside of that, you just get to live your life like Jesus and be loving and kind and joyful and peaceful and gentle, just self-controlled. This is the life Jesus lived. And so understanding joy, we first have to understand love. To understand joy and peace, we have to first understand love. And John, Jesus says, I'm giving you another new commandment to love one another, to love each other as I have loved you. And if we look at how Jesus loved his disciples, he, he corrected them. He, he told Peter, dude, you're, you're in the wrong. Get behind me. You're, you're following the world. You're, you're, you're following Satan. You're following the devil. Get behind me, Satan. Now, he called Peter out right in front of them all. He, he called James and John out. And he said, boys, you don't know what you're asking. Well, Jesus, can we sit, you know, me and the brother? Can we come up here and can we have a special spot in the kingdom too? They were a little jealous of Peter at this point. 
And he called them the sons of thunder. I love that. You know? Hey, boys. Thunder. <laughs> Come here. No, you can't. He, throughout the entire Gospels, he calls out his best friends. And he says, hey, that's not the way we're going to do it. That's not the way we should do it. And so to understand joy and peace, we first have to understand the love of Jesus. And the love of Jesus is, I think, what Paul is talking about because it is the love that is produced by following the Spirit. Galatians, Paul writes, we'll get to it in just a minute, but he says to keep in step, and, and, and I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 5. That's where we're going to be here for just a little bit. We're going to flip around to some others. But if you have your Bible with you, pull out your Bible app and turn to Galatians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, there's one underneath the seat in front of you. I would encourage you to look at it and see it because, because I want you to visually see this. Understanding joy. What is joy? Joy is a deep-seated sense of happiness and contentment that is not dependent on external circumstances. That's why in the scripture, it says you can have joy and grief all at the same time. And, and I've been to lots of funerals where there is this sense of joy because they knew their loved one was with the Lord. And even how painful it was and how difficult it was to lose that person that they deeply cared for and, and, and loved deeply, they understood there can be joy because they're with Jesus. There's no more pain, no more suffering. You don't have to deal with this world anymore. They are face to face, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And that ought to bring you some joy. There's a song out. It's an older song now, but Kenny Chesney sings it, and uh, I listened to it the other day, and I'm like, that, that's, that's what the world thinks. And then the song is, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now. That is a worldly perspective. If you listen to that song, it is the most worldly perspective about Christianity that there possibly could be, because I'm telling them, that's wrong. Everybody wants to go to heaven, and every believer wants to go now. Man, take me. I understand this world has got its trouble and got its stuff, and I love my family, and I love my friends, and I love my church. But if I had to choose, all of you, all of my family, I'm going to put Jesus first. And I'm going to go be, I'm selfish I want to go be with my Savior. Paul says it the same way. He says, I would much rather be with the Lord. But since I'm not, let me go ahead and live the way I need to live here now. And so, Lord, when you take me, thumbs up, brother. But until that day, I'm going to do the best that I can to have the kingdom on earth. Do now as it is in the kingdom on heaven. Do it now. And so that's what he calls us to do. In this section, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, joy is produced by the Holy Spirit so that joy is a choice we choose to accept. Did you hear that? Joy is a choice that we choose to accept. We don't produce joy. The Holy Spirit does. Understanding the love of Jesus produces joy in my life through the Holy Spirit. As I walk with him and keep in step with the Spirit, as I learn to live like Jesus lived, I then begin to understand what true joy is. Big things, small things, subtle things. They're not based upon the circumstances, but the circumstances bring out the joy. 
It's an emotion that is produced by the love of Jesus working out in our lives as the Holy Spirit transforms us into the person that we need to be. And so when Paul says, keep in step with the Spirit, he's telling us, walk with the Spirit so that the Spirit can transform you. If you don't, throughout the week, spend time with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father, you're not walking with him. You're kind of just stopping by on vacation at the beach house and for a couple of hours. And you're having fun, but then you go back to reality and reality sets in and you're like, man, life stinks. Life's hard. I have no joy. You're just a miserable person. It's because you're not walking with the Lord. Does walking with the Lord make everything okay? No. No. But everything's okay. Does that make sense? Y'all with me? You tracking? Luke chapter 1. Mary responded in this way. After she found out that she would have Jesus as her son, that she was going to bear the Messiah, Mary responded in, in Luke chapter 1. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. It is the spirit that rejoices through us, and we get to be the benefactor of that. When we sing praises, when we sing hallelujahs, when we sing, it is well with my soul. We sing that old song. It is the spirit that we're filling up. We're like, yes, we're in tune with this. Yes, come on. When we sing child of love, we're not talking about the 70s. Or the 60s or wherever you weird people just love, you know, child of love. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Barry, thank you. Be not. You probably were a child of love. Yes. Anybody that will wear flip-flops in here probably. Oh, never mind. I'll, I'll go on. John chapter 20. He showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Huh. They were filled with joy. Joy and peace come closely together because peace is this calmness of the heart. And I think when you understand joy, true joy, you understand it it leads right into the calmness of the heart. When I can be joyful through the Spirit in all circumstances, in all things, and I understand that Jesus loved me and I, I need to love my neighbor and I need to be a good neighbor, then this calmness of the heart comes by trusting in Jesus regardless of the storms. It surpasses my understanding it moves on beyond what I'm thinking. And in life storms, when they come, I can find joy and peace because I know Jesus has got this. I've learned from the boat, right? I've learned. He rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, Mark chapter 4, silence be seals still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was great calm. There was not just great calm in the waves. There was a great calm that went over the disciples who were in the boat. And they had this joy produced by seeing Jesus control the waves. And when the storm was rocking their world, when the storm was pushing them side to side, blowing them all over the place, they had no idea of what to go on. Jesus like, be still. And the waves suddenly went still. The boat quit rocking. And the disciples looked probably around. I, I know I would have and went, that was cool. And this peace, this joy just comes over them. Because of what Jesus has done, do you see the connection for you? 
when you begin to truly understand what Jesus has done for you and what he's continuing to do for you in the spirit, you have no other choice than to be joyful and to live at peace. Joy and peace are found in this relationship with Jesus. Although the world offers temporary happiness, Christ offers everlasting joy and peace that goes beyond our understanding. Romans chapter 15, just past our previous verse, it says, I pray that God, the source of all hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace so that you trust in him. Paul, again, uses these combinations this time he starts with hope. And I don't think it's by mistake. God, who is the source of hope, loves you deeply. And because you understand that, he will completely fill you. Notice who's doing the work here. Who's doing the work? Come on, who's doing the work? God is. And he is producing joy and peace in your life. And then it's going to overflow through the power of the Holy Spirit into the lives of the people that are around you. This hope that you have, this peace that you have, this joy that you have, that you're carrying with you at work, at the assembly line, at the carpool, at the sports field. Uh, I, I just There are times when I don't always act that way, Amen. I probably told you this story again, but I got to tell it again, maybe just to confess it. Kinley was in eighth grade. She was playing down at New Albany, down at uh, Scribner, I think. And it was a rough basketball game. And, man, they were just playing. And dad took over. And everything got deathly silent. Like this. And I yelled out in the silence because I wanted the referee to hear me I said you're going to get somebody hurt do your job you and a good friend of mine sitting behind Fair and I they go to another they go to north side and uh, she leans over to Fair and she goes well I guess Jesus has left the building. <laughs> and that's what started the tradition of suckers in the mouth during basketball games. The Holy Spirit said, if you can't keep your mouth shut, put a sucker in it. There are going to be times in our life when we lose our stuff. It's not okay. It doesn't make it right. But in those moments, we have this reminder. That's the world, and that's not Jesus. And I am the most competitive person you'll probably ever meet. We don't play games at our house. We just, board games at our house just don't end well. I want to win. And I will do everything I can to win. And that competitiveness kind of leads and bleeds over into life. But if you notice the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to talk about this love. If I love like Jesus, and I think Jesus was probably the most competitive person ever to live. I never, I only saw him kick over the table once. So I guess I've already used that in my life. But if we understand the challenge of maintaining joy and peace, we, we, can, we can begin to act more like Jesus because we do let difficulties come into play. We do let stress, we do let the brokenness of the world play and it can threaten our joy, it can threaten our peace. If we're not aware, if you and I are not aware of, of what's going on, then the worldliness, the brokenness can threaten where we're at. So Jesus promises us peace. 
And he warns us about the troubles that are going to come. So the question that I want to close on today is this. How do you and I navigate the challenges to our joy and peace in the world? How do we navigate the challenges of joy and peace? Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 reminds us that we need to not be anxious. And I want to pause and let you know that um, this month of September is the National Suicide Prevention Month. And it's a time for all of us to raise awareness to our family and to our friends and to share resources, to share ourselves, to make ourselves more open than maybe we were before, and to provide support to those who are struggling emotionally. Now, you can go on to the National Suicide Prevention website, and you can see signs, warning signs. But what I want to do for you today is this. If you're here today, and most of the time in life, um, you're never going to tell anyone. But if you're here today and you're emotionally struggling, struggling with a situation in your life, and you feel alone, you feel isolated, you feel like that storm is, is just too heavy, don't leave today without talking to someone. It doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be one of our staffs. We have loving people all around us, and all of you here are loving and caring. And so if you're struggling today and you need somebody to just kind of walk with you or talk with you to help this challenge of joy and peace, you have no joy, you have no peace. Please don't leave today without talking to someone. And you don't have to do it publicly. You can just say, hey, man, can, can I talk to you for a minute? And if somebody comes to you today and says, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And you don't feel like you can handle it, man, come get me. I will walk with you. Because that's what the Spirit tells us to do. In Galatians chapter 5, um, it tells us to keep in step with the Spirit. And there's an illustration I want to show you real quick. And um, I'm going to pick on somebody. Um, I'm not going to pick on Kitty. Keith, will you come help me, please? Sir? Keith Hastings, thank you so much. Come on up. You doing all right today? Say hi, Keith. Hello. Yeah. Stand, do me a favor and, and face that way. Stand right there. Now, when, when, you, when I say walk, I want you to kind of just walk, but walk with your feet kind of up a little bit so that I can kick your feet as you walk. Okay? <laughs> Do you remember that game in school when you would walk up behind somebody and when you would walk, go ahead, walk, and you kind of kick their feet and you're trying to like kick their feet out from under them, you know, and you're kind of kicking their feet. You're like, hey man, what's up? What's going on? Hey brother, what's happening? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was holding on to him. You saw that. I wasn't going to let him trip and fall. It's kind of difficult to do that, wasn't it? Okay, come back here. Now turn around again. I'm going to do it even harder this time. No, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> do you remember that game in school when you were and like, oh, man, and, the, and you get to feed anybody, right? When, when Paul says keep in step with the Spirit, he says this in Galatians. Hold on, stay right there. <laughs> so I say let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't do what your sinful nature craves. The NIV, the NRSV says to walk. And later on in Galatians chapter 5, let the Holy Spirit produce this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. 
control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. NIV says, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And if Keith is the Holy Spirit today, you didn't know that, did you? And he's leading me, and when he goes, Matt, let's go, and the Holy Spirit begins to lead me, and I'm not in step with him, it, it, it's, it's difficult. Yes it, is. yes, it is. The Holy Spirit turns around and goes, yes, it is. Quit kicking my feet. <laughs> now, go ahead. But if I'm watching and following the Holy Spirit... And I have my eyes focused on him, even though I have vertigo right now. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to do so many turns. <laughs> no, you're fine. Thank you. Even though I got my own issues, as long as I kept a hand on his shoulder, I didn't need to look ahead. I needed to just watch his feet. And I could go wherever he wanted me to go. We could have walked down the steps. That would have been neat. I might try that second service. Y'all come back. <laughs> but as long as I keep focus on him, I'll be able to do what he wants me to do. You guys can come on out and get the band. There's some practical ways to keep in step with the Spirit. John chapter 15 says, if you will abide in me, which just simply means to stay connected to Jesus. How do we do that? We sing. We come to church. We are the church. When we leave, we're the church. We serve. We pray. We worship. We read. We help our neighbor. Won't you be a good neighbor? Right? We do those things. Practical connection. Practical gratitude. Practice thanksgiving in your life. Look for those little things. Choose joy. Don't wait for it to happen. Look for it. When the Holy Spirit does something good, Thank him for it. Keep in step with him. Be aware. Stay focused on what Jesus is doing. Prayer, reading. And the final thing, you can rest in this. You can know this. God is on the throne. Turn to somebody and say, God's on the throne. And Jesus is sitting right next to him. And he's sitting right next to him. And they're working out the future. And the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. And when we can stay focused and keep in step with the Spirit, love produces joy and peace. And no matter what happens in your life, no matter what you're going through, no matter what pains you have, no matter what life storms going on, no matter what struggles, Jesus says, keep in step with me, stay connected to me, worship me, put me first, focus on me. And if you'll do that, walk in the spirit with me, you have freedom. And you are truly a child of God. And you're a child of love. And so when I go out here in the worst of worst, in the best of best, I can scream it from the mountain. I can scream it from the valley. Because I know I'm keeping in step with the Spirit. For you today, know that you're not alone. Know that God is fighting for you. And he who is inside of you 
is stronger than he who is around you. And God has put the Holy Spirit in your life. He has deposited it inside your body. And you get to walk with the spirit of the living God, knowing that he is bigger than the devil, bigger than the trials, bigger than the struggles. And no matter where you go, no matter what you do, you truly are a child of the living God. Amen. Let's stand it. Believe it. And if you need something today, talk to somebody. Thank you.